Guys, I've gotten a lot of emails from me over the past week, so if I don't respond within five minutes, please just sort of understand. I've gotten a lot of business to take care of, so. Uh, and if and if it seems like I'm not taking care of something, just let me know again. Just drop me a friendly message. Uh, let's see. So we're on chapter 14. Chapter 14 was about light. Uh, so far, we've just been reflection and refraction. Reflection is just when a light ray bounces off of a surface like this. And the law of reflection says that this angle, which is the incident angle, is equal to that angle, which is the reflected angle. Those two angles have to be called the law of reflection. We also were working with the law of refraction. And the law of refraction just says that when light enters a medium, its velocity changes. Its velocity becomes uh, C divided by the index of refraction. This is called refraction. You should have this in your notes already. It just says that light slows, slows down. This N value is called the index of refraction. We call it N, and N is always bigger than 1. So if you're in a vacuum where light travels at the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, a number I gave you, but you don't need to know. It'll be on your equation sheet. Um, when it enters a medium, it slows down. If it's traveling in a vacuum, then it travels at C divided by 1. The index of refraction for a vacuum is 1. So when light enters a medium, it slows down. And when light enters a medium at an angle, like let's say it's going from air to glass, for example, it enters like this. Uh, this is the incident angle. And then when it moves into the glass, it's going to bend towards the normal. And this is called the refracted angle. All right. Uh, and we talked about how we can determine if it moves towards or away from the normal, if we imagine this front of waves. And as I have this front of waves that moves through, at the place where the waves first touch the medium, like right here, it's going to slow down. And that's going to cause this whole thing to move around like this, like a tank. It's going to shift the whole wave front over. And when it enters this medium, it will have shifted the light ray towards the normal. And then likewise, if I'm moving from a high index to a low index, is it going to shift towards or away from the normal? That is, if I'm moving from glass to air, what's it going to do, towards or away from the, the line? It's going to shift away from the normal. So um, Whenever you have light that travels in one direction, it will also travel in the opposite direction. It's uh, reciprocal, I guess. So if I have a light ray that's traveling in this direction, it's going to shift away from that normal line. This line, I don't know if I said this, but this line right here is what we call the normal line. All right. You could very much have a question on the test that would look something like this, uh, where I show you an interface, like say air, and water, and say the index of refraction here is 1, the index of refraction here is 1.3, and I have a light ray that comes in, and I ask you which of these rays is, is the correct ray? Is it this ray where it just keeps going straight on? Is it this ray? Or is it this ray? That would be A, B, or C. So which would it be in this case? If I'm moving from air to water, would the uh, appropriate light ray be A, B, or C? It would be C. When it moves from a low index to a high index, it's going to shift towards the normal. Imagine that I have this, uh, this wave front, front of waves coming along here. At this point, this side of the wave is going to slow down because it enters a high index of refraction. This point is going to slow down, and this point is going to keep going fast. So it's going to shift over, and then it's going to move in the direction of C. 
that would be a good test question for you. you need, so you need to know how light responds when it enters into different media. Is that clear? I mean, let's just try one more. So uh, what about if I have a light ray that's going from glass to air? I have this light ray that comes in. Is it going to go in that direction? We'll call that B. Is it going to go in that direction? I'll call that A. Or will it go in that direction? I'll call that C. It's moving from glass, which has an index of n equal 1.5, to air, which is n equal 1. Which is it going to be, A, B, or C? It's going to be A, right, because my, uh, my light ray moves along in glass. It's moving more slowly. And so when it gets here, this point of the wave front is going to speed up. And so it's going to shift around like this. And then it's going to travel along A. Moving from high index to low index, my light ray bends away from the normal. Moving from low index to high index, it bends towards the normal. It's like a tank, right? If you move one side faster, it shifts around one way or the other. All right. I have a little video about this. I think it's fairly interesting. Did I show you the lawnmower video? No. A student made this for me a, a number of years ago where he showed this effect of refraction being the effect of refraction being caused by these differences in velocities in a lawnmower. I thought it was pretty cool, so I'll show you all. So it's not really light that he's showing. This is uh, oh, I think I tried to show it to you, but it wouldn't work, right? Oh yeah, that was the problem. Something about this computer. Oh well, it's not important. I'm sorry. It was very important actually. All right, let's move on to lenses. Again, this is in chapter 14, if you're following along in the book. Um, we're going to deal with a couple of different lenses, and we'll look at the end of this chapter and how we use these lenses in different devices, like magnifying glasses, for example. Uh, the first lens is called a convex lens. This is probably what you think of when you think of a lens. Uh, this is also called a converging lens. It looks like this. Is that what y'all think of when you think of a lens? You have these two spherical sides. If I were to imagine this lens uh, and creating this lens, I would create it like this. I would take a big sphere of glass like this. And then I would take another sphere of glass, like this. And this little section in between would be my lens. So if I could take these two big spheres of glass and squish them together, and then take out the intersecting piece, that is what would give me a lens. So it has two spherical sides. I have a, this is a convex lens. I'll pass around you can look at. Uh, you can use it as a magnifying glass, so you can look at things. So you can take a look at your chair or whatever and magnify it. This is a magnifying glass. That's what you use to make a magnifying glass. I also pass around a sheet of paper here because you can also make images with the lens. So I, the lights work best. You can sort of play around with it, and you can find where is the sharpest image. Um, you can also, let's see if I can do it on the screen, actually. Y'all can all see it. I don't know if this will work. 
Uh, yeah, y'all can see the uh, the lights on the screen, the big row of dots. So you can play around with this. I'll pass it around. Take a look at the screen. I want you to notice how both sides are spherical. They're like little parts, little edges of a big sphere. And then you can try it as a magnifying glass, and then also try it just making an image with the screen. And we'll look at these and how they work. Please don't drop it. It will break. Drop it. All right, so there are a couple of things about lenses that we'll need to be aware of. First of all, if I were to make these lenses out of big spheres, then that means that I must have a radius. Uh, and so this radius of the sphere, we're going to call this point C. C is called the center of curvature. And we also have a center of curvature on this side. That's also C. Um, another point that we'll be interested in is called the focal length, or the focal point. And that's going to be here. I'm going to call it F. F is the focal point. Or sometimes you have it referred to as the focal length. The focal point is the point in space, and the length is the distance from the lens to the focal point. But I often use them interchangeably. Um, the focal length, or the focal point. So if I were to, uh, the focal point then is one half the center of curvature. That's the focal length is equal to one half the center of curvature. But the focal length is also the point where parallel rays focus. So if I have a lens, a convex lens like this, and I have light rays that come into it that are parallel, they're going to focus at the focal point. And that's why it's called the focal point, because it's a point of focus, uh, the focal point. How do I get parallel rays? I mean, I can, in the lab, I can generate parallel rays, just create them, have two rays of light that go parallel to one another. But what's another way that I can have parallel rays coming from a, a source of light? What happens as I, as I move a source farther and farther away? Let, let's imagine that. I'll draw a picture. Let's imagine that uh, I'm at the sun. So here's the sun. And I have these light rays that are emanating in all directions. Now, if I'm sitting right at the surface of the sun, those light rays are not parallel, right? They're going apart from one another. But as I move further and further away, if I move all the way over here, the light rays that come from the sun are basically all parallel. So if I have an object that's very, very far away, then the light from that object is going to be parallel. So uh, there's something you can do with a convex lens that you've probably all done, I think, uh, where you can go out and you can uh, point it at the sun. And then what do you do with it? Have you ever done this, like with a magnifying glass? You can set something on fire, right, because it takes all that light from the, the sun, the light that's coming parallel, and it focuses it all at the focal point. So you can take a, a magnifying glass and, I don't know, put it on paper or leaves or ants or whatever it is that you want to do, and you can focus those light, the light from the sun at the focal point of the lens and it generates some fairly intense heat. My son has a magnifying glass, and we like to play around with it like we do this. Y'all have done this before? No? Well, you should. It's kind of fun. Uh, we'd go out today and do it, but there's no sun today. Maybe next time. We'll see. Um, anyway, we were playing around with his magnifying glass, and I thought, I wonder how hot that is, really, like where the sunlight comes together. And so I just sort of put it over my hand just for a moment, and it's pretty hot. 
Like, y'all should try it out because it's fairly intense. It hurt a lot. Uh, it could really burn you if you if you held it there for more than a second or so. But you should try it. It's a very memorable experience. All right, so let's see. When we talk about lenses, we also talk about their strengths. Uh, often this is referred to as power of a lens. Uh, the strength refers to the effect of the lens on light. It's measured in diopters. The unit is a diopter. Um, and let's imagine that these two lenses. I have this lens. It has a focal point here and here. And then I have another lens that's sort of more spherically shaped. Uh, let me try to redraw that. On the second lens, do you think that the focal point of the second lens is bigger or smaller than the focal point of the first lens? Is it bigger or smaller than the focal point of the first lens? It's smaller, right? Because those spheres have been made with a smaller radius, and so they have a smaller focal point. So on the second lens, my focal point is much smaller. My focal point might be I don't know, here. So I'm going to redraw this just to make it more dramatic. I'll draw the focal points here and here. And here the focal points might be here or here. Now which of these lenses is going to have a greater effect on the light that comes in? So light rays are going to come in. They'll be parallel. For both of these, which of these, the first lens or the second lens, will cause the light to change its path more? The first lens or the second lens? The second lens. Yeah, so the second lens is going to cause the light to focus at this point, which is the focal point. So it's going to cause it to bend more than this one. So both of them focus the light at the focal point it's there. But this one causes the light to bend quite a bit more because it has a smaller focal point. So the smaller focal length lends itself to more bending of light. Which, based on our definition of strength, lends itself to uh, more strength of the lens. So if I were to set up a relationship between S and the focal length, if my focal length increases, what's going to happen to the strength of my lens? If my focal length goes up, what's going to happen to the strength of the lens? Is it going to go up or down? If my focal length goes up, what happens to the strength? Is it going to go up or down? It's going to go down. So as my focal length gets bigger, the uh, strength of the lens is going to get smaller. So there's an inverse relationship between S and the focal length. And that's going to look like this. The strength of a lens is equal to 1 over the focal length. The strength is uh, capital S. All right. So, for example, if I had a, uh, a focal length, which is pretty simple, but if I have a, a lens with focal length equal to uh, positive 0 0.1 meters, 
Then what is the strength? Then I would just say S is equal to 1 over S, which is 1 over 0 0.1 meters, and that's going to be equal to 10 diopters. It would have a power of 10 diopters or a strength of 10 diopters. All right, that equation will be on your equation sheet, but you'll need to know how to calculate the strength of a particular lens. As I said, this is also often called the power of a lens, but we won't use that word just because we've already used power to refer to energy per unit time. All right, there's another type of lens. It's called a concave lens. A uh, concave lens looks like this. Uh, light rays that come into a concave lens that are parallel will diverge. So this is also called a diverging lens. Uh, the light rays are going to diverge in such a way that if I were to trace them back, they would go through the focal point. Right. So the light rays diverge in such a way that they'll go through the focal point. If I were to imagine these lenses being two spheres, kind of like I did with a convex lens, it would look like this. I'd have one sphere like this and one sphere like this. And then the lens is this space in between these two spheres. All right, so that's how it gets its spherical shape, uh, whereas the convex lens is like two, two spheres squished together. These are two spheres that are not squished together, and the space in between them is the lens. All right, obviously, we get this by taking a piece of glass and grinding it down and smoothing it, but smoothing it so that it gets this shape. Some of you that have glasses, we'll talk about this a little bit later, will use these kind of lenses, while others of you will use a uh, converging lens. It depends if you're near or far-sighted. All right, so a uh, concave lens is a diverging lens. Its focal length is a negative value. So it has a negative focal length. And as a result, the strength of the lens is also negative. All right, so it has a negative focal length, and then the, uh, the strength of the lens is also negative. On the test, if I give you a particular lens, I'll tell you whether or not the focal length is positive or negative. So if you have a convex lens and you're working with that to find the strength, for example, or I'll we'll work through some other problems where you have to find image and object distance, uh, I'll tell you whether or not the focal length is positive or negative. So like, for example, with the previous problem, if you were dealing with a concave lens, then I would say it has a focal length of negative 0.1 meters. And so it would make the strength to become negative as well. Is that clear? All right. The focal length is different just because the light responds differently. And uh, we'll get into sort of finding images and what have you. And it becomes a little bit different dealing with the concave lens. Is that clear so far? So, so far we have convex lenses. Convex lenses have a focal length and a center of curvature. The focal length is half that radius of the sphere, or half the center of curvature, but the focal length is also the point where parallel light rays focus. Uh, you can find the strength of a lens, which is a number that describes how much it affects the light by taking the inverse of the focal length. Are you all done with that lens, Daniel? Everybody get to see it? You should have some eyeglasses made out of these. I have two of them if anybody needs them. How would that be? All right. Uh, likewise, with concave lenses, 
unlike convex lenses, concave lenses are diverging, not converging. That means they cause the light to diverge when the light rays are parallel. They have a negative focal length. Is that yours? Is it yours, Jessica? What is it? Is it yours? Is it yours? Where did it come from? Is it yours? Somebody's messing around, right? All right. My little boy, when he was like two, I guess, he would come to church with us, and he liked he liked trucks, right? And he would. We have a little bit of church. It's like maybe. 30 feet to the back of the room, and we would be at the back, and he would get his trucks going, vroom, vroom, and send it all the way up the aisle. He was pretty cute. All right. All right. Let's look at image formation. You've already created an image, right, when you did the, the lens with a little sheet of paper. Uh, there are two types of images that we'll deal with. Actually, you created two types of images, if you did what I asked. Uh, there are two types of images that you created. One of them was a virtual image. I'll write this on the board in just a second. You created a virtual image, and that was when you, uh, when you used the lens as a magnifying glass. That was a virtual image. Uh, and then you also created a real image, and that was when you actually projected the, the light onto your screen. And that's a real image. So there are two types of images. Real images, which can be projected onto a screen, and then virtual images, which cannot be projected onto a screen. Image formation. As I said, there are two types of images. Uh, the first is a real image, and a real image can be projected onto a screen. All right, so it's not that you're uh, that you're looking through the lens and seeing it but it's that you're proje actually projecting the, the image onto a screen. And then you're seeing the image on the screen, which was a sheet of paper. A virtual image, you can still see, but you don't see it in a, on a screen. All right, so it cannot be projected onto a screen. Two types of images. A real image, you can project it onto a screen. A virtual image, it can't be projected onto a screen. So, onto a screen. So, for example, let's set an example. This is like the image on the paper that you saw, where the paper acted as your screen, and this was like the magnifying glass. You can still see the image, but you can't project it onto a screen. We'll see this again with mirrors, and I think it makes a little more sense with mirrors, but I'll also show you how to determine where that image is when we actually begin to draw rays for some of these lenses. Right, so there are two types of images, real and virtual, screen and no screen. We're going to determine the positions of those images in a couple of different ways. We're going to look at how to trace rays, how to trace light rays as they go through a lens, and then we'll also do that with mirrors. And then we'll also use the lens equation. Both of them are fairly straightforward. There are just a few simple rules that you'll need to follow. Let's do the ray tracing first. All right, so if I have a, I'm going to have a couple rules for tracing rays through a lens. So rules for ray tracing. You'll need to know these rules. Uh, as we get closer to the exam, I'll let you know sort of what to expect as far as this goes. Um, likely what I'll have is 
I'll have a lens with a series of rays, some of which are drawn correctly and some of which are drawn incorrectly, and you'll have to pick out which is correct and or incorrect. So the rules for ray tracing are this. Uh, a ray parallel to the axis will go through the focal point. All right, so if I have a convex lens, we've already shown this, if I have a ray that's parallel to the axis, it's going to go through the focal point, where these are the focal points, here and here. All right, that's for a converging lens, and a converging lens uh, causes the rays to converge at the focal point. So a ray parallel to the axis will go through the focal point. A ray through the focal point will go parallel to the axis. So this is the exact opposite of rule number one. It's like rule number one backwards. So if I have a, uh, a lens, have a focal point here and here. If I have a ray that travels through the focal point like that, then when it comes out of the lens, it's going to go parallel to the axis. So notice this is just the exact opposite of rule number one. And with lenses and with mirrors, that's always true. That if I have a ray that goes in one direction and it responds, then the exact opposite should also be true. That the ray will bend will travel both ways through the lens or the mirror. And then the third one is just through the center of the lens. Unbent. So for example, with a convex lens like this, I can have a ray that just travels like that. But I can also have a ray, if this is the center of the lens, that travels like that. A ray that goes through the center of the lens will go through completely unrefracted. It will just go straight through. Now actually what happens is when I come here, it bends a little bit in one direction. And then when I come here, it bends back in the opposite direction. So the light ray, when it comes on the other side of the lens, will be going along the same path that it was when it entered the lens. All right, so there are those three rules, and we'll use these for both lenses and for mirrors. Right. Three rules. So for example, we're just going to do two examples. If I want to find out where images are formed for a convex lens, a convex lens looks like this. There's my focal point there and there. I'm going to say that this is my object over here. And see, this is my axis right here. I call it the optical axis, or we'll just call it the axis. This is the object. And again, these are the focal points here and here. You're not going to have to draw ray diagrams, so you might have one in your homework. I'll have to see. I'll get the homework up soon. Uh, but you will have to be able to select out which are the best ray diagram, which are the correct rays. So rule number one, I draw a ray parallel to the axis, and then it goes through the focal point. Just like that. Parallel to the axis and through the focal point. Rule number two says through the focal point and then parallel to the axis. Through the focal point right there, and then parallel to the axis. This is rule number two, and this is rule number one. You only need two rays to figure out where an image is, and in this case, uh, my image is right here, where these two rays cross, and it's going to look like this. Um, the rays that originate at the top of the arrow, the rays that originate here are going to reconnect down here. 
And then you can do similar things, like let's say I picked another spot on this object. If I had rays that originated right there, then those rays would cross right here until you formed your full image. Right? Is this image inverted or upright? What is it? Is it inverted, upside down, or is it upright? It's inverted. Right, thank you. So uh, this is an inverted image. Any idea whether this is a real or a virtual image? Is this a real or virtual? Now, you don't have a real reason to know this, but it's not a virtual image. This is a real image, all right? Uh, anytime I have a, an image that's on the opposite side of the lens from the object, that's going to be a real image. I like to think of it as a projector, because a projector has a lens, it has some object inside the projector, and then the the image is on the screen on the other side. So this particular image is a real image, and it's inverted. This is a real inverted image. This is the type of image that your eyeball makes, by the way. So this is a real inverted image. And we'll look at how the eye works optically uh, probably on Thursday. Okay, so that's one ray diagram that you'll need to know how to make. Oh, and then there's a third ray that I can draw just through the center of the lens. The third ray is unnecessary here because I already know where the image is, but I can draw a ray straight through the center of the lens like that, and notice that it crossed at the same point. So this is ray number three, and this is a real inverted image. So if I put a screen right here, it would show an image of that arrow or whatever it is. That was like holding the, the piece of paper behind the, uh, the lens. All right. The next ray diagram is a little more difficult for a concave lens. Let's say that my focal points are here and here. draw an axis, right, and then I'll imagine that my source is back here. Right, I can draw, I'm just going to draw two rays here. First I'm going to draw a ray that is parallel to the axis, that's rule number one. And if you recall, I'm going to go back a slide or two. If you recall this, when I have a concave lens, it causes those rays to diverge, but they diverge in such a way that if you trace them back, they go through the focal point. And so this is like rule number one. That's what we're going to do here for rule number one. All right, so it's going to diverge, but in such a way that if I trace it back, it goes through the focal point. And then I can draw a second ray. This is rule number one. I'm going to draw a second ray just by rule number three. We're not going to worry about rule number two. Rule number three right there. And this is where the two rays cross. And so that's where my image is. All right. This is an upright image. Do you think that it's real or virtual, this image? Real or virtual? It, this is a virtual image. When the, uh, the image is on the same side as the object, on the back side of the lens, then that's going to be a virtual image. So this is a uh, upright virtual image. This might not seem to have a real obvious use to you, but we'll see when we look at the human eye, uh, its uses for adjusting for misshapen eyeballs. I can readjust the light. All right. So those are the two ray diagrams that you need to know for lenses. And you'll have two similar diagrams for mirrors as well. As I said, likely on the exam, what you would have is I would have a figure, and it would have several rays drawn, and one of them would be incorrect, and you would have to pick one, which one of those is incorrect. All right. 
let's uh, let's show you now the Lenz equation. And there'll be several homework problems on this. This is another way to find the image formation is through the Lenz equation. Uh, the Lenz equation, this will be on your equation sheet, but it's 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance equals 1 over the focal length. Uh, make sure that you practice with the problems on this on the homework, which I said I'll have up today or tomorrow, uh, just to make sure that you can manipulate this equation effectively. So if I were to draw a picture here, I like to label it. So this is my focal point here and here. Say that I have an object over here. This distance from the lens to the object is going to be my object distance. So O is the object distance. And then if I think about the rays, I had two rays parallel to the axis through the focal point, through the focal point parallel to the axis, so my image is going to be over here. That's just like the ray diagram I did before. And so this distance is my image distance. So I is the image distance. And O is the object distance. This equation is on your equation sheet, uh, and you just need to practice to make sure you know how to use it. There's another thing. Whenever you have these lenses, it's very useful to know the magnification. M is the magnification. And M is equal to negative uh, I over O. All right, the magnification is also equal to the image height over the object height. So H prime is the image height, and H is the object height. All right, so if I'm using this as a magnifying glass, and I look at something that's, you know, a centimeter across, but then I look at the image, and the image appears to be two centimeters across, what is my magnification? It's what? You have no idea. Well, if I have something that's one centimeter across, and then I look at it in my magnifying glass, and it appears to be two centimeters across, it looks twice as big, right? So my magnification is going to be two. That's the image height, which is two centimeters, over the object height, which would be one centimeter. All right. So that's fairly intuitive, I think. It's just the image height over the object height. Or also, if I look through a lens and something appears smaller than it actually is, Say, if it, if it appears to be one centimeter, but it's actually two centimeters, then the magnification would be one half. So that's our magnification, and I'll work through some examples here. Uh, let me just sort of give you a little table of signs here. I want to make this in a separate little place on your paper. Uh, so it's just going to be a sort of a summary for converging lens. This is also called convex lens. They have a positive focal length. For diverging lenses, that's concave. They have a negative focal length. If I have a negative image distance, that's going to tell me that I have a virtual image. Remember, a virtual image can't be projected onto a screen. And if I find that it has a negative image distance, then that tells me it's a virtual image. If I have a positive image distance, that's going to be a real image. Uh, if my magnification, the absolute value of my magnification is greater than 1, that means that the image is bigger. than the object. If my magnification is less than 1, that means that the image 
is smaller. So if I have a magnification of one half, for example, that would mean that the uh, the image is half the size of the original object. And then also, if my magnification is negative, my magnification is less than zero, that means that the image is inverted. And if my magnification is greater than zero, that means that the image is upright. So if I have a magnification of negative two, that means that my image is twice as big as the object and it's upside down. If I have a magnification of positive three, that means that the image is three times the size of the object and it's upright. Let's work through an example using the lens equation and the magnification and then we'll uh, wrap it up for the day. So let's say that I have a convex lens. I'm sorry, everybody get that? All right, so I have a convex lens. has a focal length of plus 10 centimeters. An object is 20 centimeters from the lens. Uh, what is the image height? And the image height, if you recall, is h prime. All right, so the magnification is h prime over h. Oh, and then also uh, the object height is given h, let's say, is 5 centimeters. All right, so I have this convex lens that has a focal length of 10 centimeters. I have an object that's 20 centimeters away. Uh, I want to find if the object height is 5 centimeters, how big is the image going to be? And then I can say some stuff about the image as I go along. The first thing I need to find is to find the image height. And then once I find the image height, I can find the magnification. And then once you find the magnification, you can find the, uh, I'm sorry, need to find the image distance first, then find the magnification, and then find the uh, image height. So I have these formulae. So I'm going to take this one first. I'm going to solve it for the uh, image height. So I'm going to have uh, 1 over the focal length, which is 10 equals to 1 over the object distance, which is 20, plus 1 over the image distance. And then I need to solve that for i. Uh, so I'm going to subtract 1 over 20 from both sides. I can find a common denominator, which will give me uh, negative 1 over 20, plus 2 over 20, equals 1 over i. And then that's going to give me uh, 1 over 20 equals 1 over i. And so my image distance is going to be 20 centimeters. Image distance is 20 centimeters. Is this a real or virtual image? On the test, I could ask you questions like this just to describe the image. How about this one, real or virtual? It's a real image. And the reason I know it's real is because it has a positive image distance. Right, the image distance is positive, so it's a real image. All right, so this is a real image. Because I is positive. Now, I, after I find I, I can find my magnification. My magnification is going to be negative I over O, that's negative 20 
over the object distance, which is uh, 20 centimeters. My object distance was given up here. And so that's equal to negative 1. So I have a magnification of negative 1. So what is going to be my, my uh, image height? What is my image height? If I have a magnification of negative 1 and my object is 5 centimeters tall, how big is my image going to be? What? Well, a magnification of 1 means that it's what? It's the same size, right? So in this case, my image height is going to also be 5 centimeters. Is that image going to be upright or inverted? It's going to be inverted. And the reason that we know it's inverted is because the magnification is what? It's what? Negative, right. So because the magnification is negative, it's an inverted image. And because the magnification has a magnitude of 1, uh, the image height is also 5 centimeters. Let me just write that. So because it's negative, uh, image is inverted. And because it's 1, the image is the same height as the object. That is to say 5 centimeters. All right. So it would look something like this. Uh, I'd have my lens here. I'd have my object over here. It would be 5 centimeters tall. And my image would be over here, and it would also be 5 centimeters tall. All right, this distance would be 20 centimeters, and this distance would also be 20 centimeters. All right, on the test you wouldn't have a question with so many steps, but any one of these individual problems, that is finding the image distance, finding the magnification, or finding the height of the image, any one of those could be a uh, fair game for the quiz, which will be part of the final. All right, we'll work through some more examples on uh, next time we meet Thursday, I guess. And um, bring me your projects on Thursday. All right, and if you want to do a presentation to the class, then you can do that uh, Tuesday, most, on Tuesday. Just talk to me about that. What's that? If you get it to me by the end of the day, that's fine. All right. You guys have a good day, okay? I know you are real busy, but uh.